Um, so that makes this all really particularly, I think, uh, important and poignant. Uh, entitled State of Emergency was dubbed the speech of a generation by ABC News. Um, we're going to be joined in a little while also by uh, Linda Sarsour. She is an award-winning racial justice and civil rights activist, seasoned community organizer and mother of three. She is a Palestinian Mo Muslim American born and raised in Brooklyn. She's the former executive director of the Arab American Association of New York, co-chair of the Women's March on Washington and co-founder of the first Muslim online organizing platform, Empower Change, which is a terrific platform. I highly recommend you check it out if you haven't. Um, Linda's also the author of We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders, a memoir of love and resistance. Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum serves as the spiritual leader of Congregation Beit Simcha Torah. She was installed as CBST's first rabbi in 1992 during the height of the AIDS crisis when the synagogue was in desperate need of pastoral care and spiritual leadership. Under her leadership as senior rabbi, CBST has become a powerful voice in the movement for equality and justice for people of all sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions, and a significant force challenging the radical rights dominance over religious and political life in the United States and around the world. Um, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant, who um, I'm told will might have to leave uh, a bit early tonight. And so Dr. Bryant, we're gonna keep that in mind as the, as the evening goes on. Um, he is a civil rights activist and community organizer who combines biblical teaching, business acumen, and political insight to propel his congregants to action and greater levels of faith. Um, Dr. Bryant, a third generation minister, was the founding pastor of Empowerment Temple AME Church in Baltimore, Maryland, acclaimed as the fastest growing African Methodist Episcopal Church in the denomination, denomination's 200 year history. Uh, programs under his guidance have aimed to spread the gospel, develop strong leaders, empower and the economically disadvantaged, and challenge social injustices. In December 2018, Dr. Bryant was appointed the senior pastor of New Birth Missionary Baptist Church in Lithonia, Georgia. I hope I got the name of that city right. Uh, pastor Michael McBride has been active in ministry for over 20 years. Uh, Pastor McBride's commitment to holistic ministry can be seen through his leadership roles in both the church and community organizations. Uh, Pastor McBride founded the Way Christian Center in West Berkeley, where he presently serves as the lead pastor. In March 2012, he became the director for the Live Free campaign with Faith in Action, a campaign led by hundreds of faith congregations throughout the United States committing to addressing gun violence and mass incarcer incarceration of young people of color. He's one of the national leaders in the movement to implement public health and community-centered gun violence prevention programs, which have contribute to, contributed to 50% reductions of gun-related homicides in Oakland and many other cities across the country. He's also a founder of Black Church Pack and the National Black Brown Gun Violence Prevention Consortium. Um, quick word about myself. I am a political analyst and the uh, president of Rethinking Foreign Policy. I recently published uh, Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics, which I co-authored with Mark Lamont Hill uh, just in February. Uh, previously, I worked as the uh, vice president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, the founding director of the United States Office of B'Tselem, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, and founding co-director of Jewish Voice for Peace. So with that, um, I will hand it over to Tamika. I just um, briefly want to say thank you. Um, I, I see so many faces here of folks who I love um, and who have been at different points of my life um, a part of my story. And state of emergency really does belong to all of us um, because as I go through the book and, and just thinking about all of the uh, experiences and the moments that I'm sharing in this book, we've all been together through the different parts and, the di and you all have uh, such incredible voices and um, are really experts in the areas that are covered in this book. And so um, I really have tried to write something that is relatable and something that belongs to the entire community. So I just wanna thank you all as friends, mentors, uh, and supporters of the work for being here this evening to have this conversation. Mitchell, we appreciate you and all that you do uh, to be a strong accomplice in this work. Um, and let's, you know, have a great conversation. I think as 
Um, Pastor Bryant has to go. Um, hopefully we can start off with allowing him to get the first uh, chance at giving remarks. Oh, and of course, Barbara's Bookstore. I just need to say thank you to you as well. Well, thanks, Tamika. Um, I, I, I think, yeah, let us, um, let, let's go around and just, if folks want to do some brief opening remarks before I get to some questions that stem from uh, Tamika's wonderful book. And yes, please, um, Reverend, Dr., uh, Reverend Dr. Bryant, please, if you would go first, um, hopefully we can hear everything you have to say before you have to leave us. Yeah, I, I would do absolutely anything to go before Pastor Mike McBride, <laughs> so I'm grateful uh, for that privilege. Uh, the state of emergency really is a, a blaring indictment for me uh, for uh, the community of faith. This is the largest generation of young African-Americans who believe in God, but are not aligned to a local assembly of faith. Uh, it is a critical moment for the church to realize its emergency uh, as the generation is wondering about its relevance and whether or not the church has contracted laryngitis to not speak truth to power. Uh, and so I read it uh, not really uh, just in uh, the sleeve as an activist, but as a pastor that is trying to synergize a community uh, so that they can hear really uh, the drumbeat of what's taking place. Uh, Tamika Mallory uh, graced us here at New Birth in Stonecrest, Georgia to preach for us on Mother's Day. Uh, and uh, she did it kicking and screaming, uh, but she did it uh, really as necessary. Uh, Dr. King talked about the priesthood of all believers, uh, that anybody who has a testimony has a story. And if you have a story, you have a responsibility. Uh, and so I took it personal uh, to respond to this uh, call of state of emergency. Uh, while Tamika was uh, speaking at our church, she referenced the foreword of uh, the conversation between Cardi B and Angela Davis. And uh, some of my old church mothers was asking, why in the world is she talking about Cardi B on Mother's Day? Uh, <laughs> that ain't who we wanna talk about on Mother's Day. But that is what the call of the gospel is about, uh, is reaching those who are the least, the lost and the forgotten. And last but not least, I think it is serendipitous that we would have this conversation uh, on the anniversary of uh, George Floyd. And so our prayers today go out for that family and all the more uh, for that community uh, and for all the activists who need to know that they are seen, they are heard, and they are prayed for. Thank you so much. Um, those are some really, I, I think, really poignant uh, words that, you know, hit me on a very deep level. And I, I mean, you know, looking forward to this event today, all day for me was really quite an experience, you know, being the day that it is. And I, I just, I'm so glad that we have a way to acknowledge that and, and, uh, and address it. Uh, and I'm planning to do that a little more with a few other questions that I'll have for you later. But for right now, uh, Pastor Mike, would you care to offer us a few words? Well, obviously, it, it is a blessing to be here with uh, our dear sister, uh, Tamika, and um, the very loquacious uh, Jamal Bryant, who I, I guess, have the, um, the blessing of following, praise God, um, his, his, his remarks and to my friend Tamika and my new friend, Rabbi, who I had an opportunity to meet um, with Bishop Leah Daughtry actually yesterday. Um, I will just continue to um, perhaps extend on, on Pastor Jamal's theme. It is the case that um, we, we as a people in the United States of America, uh, by default, have needed to be the prophetic voice to steer America out of its impending rut. Um, and, and the state of emergency is another uh, such example of the clarion call and the unique voice of Tamika Maller. She is uh, a unique voice for this generation, for this time. And uh, many of us who come from the tradition of the Black church, where uh, we have always been a voice crying out in the wilderness, uh, calling America, uh, and dare I say the world, um, back into right relationship with the creator and creation, uh, I am always pleased to be able to stand with uh, Tamika and not just honor her voice, but her story. Uh, you know, people who have endured uh, the hardship of life uh, have a unique perspective on uh, not just the problem, but also the solutions. 
And Tamika is not just one of these pop-up folks who, uh, you know, in the Black church, sometimes we say every Negro think they're a preacher by turning their collar inside out and, and grabbing a, a pulpit and start preaching. Uh, but Tamika has put in decades of, of not just um, work and formation, uh, but she's accountable to folks on the ground. She's accountable to her family and to her crew of folks um, who really not only speak truth to her, but she in return uh, offers such deep loyalty and respect and love. And so uh, I'm glad to certainly be able to be here to help amplify not just um, her book and, and her story, but also uh, invite all of us um, into a space where our voices can become a megaphone uh, for the state of emergency this country is in. We are a relatively young country. 250 years is not a long time, um, and it is not a guarantee this country can't continue to exist in its current form uh, without making some radical shift. Dr. King said that we all should be ambulance drivers, and we should run red lights sounding the alarm that reminds us of our uh, need to make some radical changes, and this is another one of those uh, uh, ambulances that are riding through the red lights, uh, calling all of us to join in healing, uh, not just the soul, but the body of America. And uh, so it's great to be here with my friend and friends, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, Rabbi Kleinbaum, I think it, um, it it's, I'd like to, I'm, I'm eager to hear from you. I think um, this will, you, you have a, a, a different point of view. I don't know how different the, the points will be, but I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, I share the honor of being here. I consider this book uh, to be part of the sacred texts of the American people. Wow. And it's a recent book, and we don't usually talk about recent books as being part of a sacred canon, but I predict that this is part of the sacred texts of this country. I don't say that lightly, or I don't, and I don't say that just because it is a text that combines some very, very significant religious themes. First of all, Tamika, you share with us the deep vulnerability of being a human being who's trying to make your way in the world. That's so profound. You're not pretending to be uh, without pain yourself and with all the answers. You're sharing with us the vulnerability of the human struggle to make meaning, to create community, to save lives. It's so deeply vulnerable at the same time, visionary and confident with the voice of a prophet. I find that combination um, very moving. It's not just telling us what to do, which for sure we need that, but it's also you're showing us because all of us are vulnerable and weak. All of us mm -hmm. make mistakes and don't make the right choices all the time. All of us have to live with regrets and disappointments about our lives. All of us. And what you're doing is you're giving us a model for how to live with all of that and move forward with the grace of God. And I need to just say that you end the book with these words. I got so choked. I'm actually getting choked up right now. Well, I have acknowledged everyone, I reserve my highest praise for God. And with that, you end the book. I'm gonna stop right there because for me, this is a sacred text. I have a lot to say about it. I'm sure in the conversation we'll explore it, but I'm grateful to add this to my bookcase of sacred texts. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everybody uh, for those wonderful opening statements. Um, I think it really crystallizes the importance of the book that Tamika has written um, and and the context in which it, it, it happens. And, and in that spirit, I'm actually gonna zoom us out a little bit uh, to address a question that, that came up certainly for me in, in reading this book, um, because Tamika writes a lot about the shared sacrifice of uh, marginalized Americans throughout history. Um, this was a place that, you know, when I, when Mark Lamont Hill and I began uh, our communication about writing a book together, you know, this was, I, I had been very struck by his work in Nobody, um, uh, the book he wrote in the wake of the Ferguson protests, um, that crossed so many lines and brought so much into what was clearly a racial justice issue, but he ex managed to expand it to so many other social justice issues. And it was a place that he and I just had some really wonderful talks about and helped inspire the book that we wrote. So 
one of the things that has occurred to me, especially in the past year, um, is that while we have done a lot of talking um, about racial justice, social justice, um, and, and changes that need to be made, there's been very little actual action that's been taken. And um, one of the things that I was saying today to some folks is that, you know, it seems to me that very little has actually changed and, and that a lot of what we've seen in the past year has been pushback. And one of the ways that regressive forces uh, work to put um, to work to push back against change is um, precisely by turning various groups against each other. So the question that I want to put to all of you is how do we how do we create movements that respect differences and respect different histories, but also can come together to make the kind of change that we all want to see? And again, Reverend Dr. Bryan, I'm going to ask you to go first so that we make sure to get your your wisdom on this. Yeah. I want to first uh, posit that the gospel in and unto itself is offensive, uh, is that uh, people are going to take uh, issue that uh, our responsibility is not masseuse, but chiropractors, uh, that you're not necessarily going to feel better, but it's going to change your backbone. Uh, and so I think that America has got to deal with uh, the ugliness and the uncomfortability of uh, looking at itself. A uh, philosopher once said, it's easier to look out the window than it is to look in the mirror. Uh, so we can see what's going on wrong all over the world, but can never see what's happening right in our right. own backyard. And so I think that we've got a responsibility uh, to uh, really eye out what is happening uh, right here in our own uh, front. Uh, and so, yes, I think that we've got to raise ourselves, raise our voices about Palestine, uh, but in that same tenor, we got to raise our voice about Chicago. Uh, and so I think that, uh, uh, that that is our responsibility, that it's not going to be comfortable, but it's absolutely going to be necessary. Thank you so much. Um, go next, uh, Robert Kleinbaum, would you care to weigh in on this? The same question? Before you, before you uh, uh, are yeah, speaking, um, Rabbi, let me just say right. that it's important to note that the way in which uh, my relationship began and has developed with Rabbi Sharon was through the difficulty of having movements that had people with different perspectives, but all trying to fight for the same goal. And so we're not speaking of something that um, is not, it's, it's not a distant reality. It's actually a reality for which great relationships have developed um, and particularly when you had at the helm of uh, the organizing structure of the Women's March, a Palestinian Muslim woman from Brooklyn who has now joined us, uh, Linda Sarsour, um, who is you know, my dear sister and my co-conspirator, if you will, in so many different areas. Um, then you had a Mexican born, a Mexican American uh, woman by the name of Carmen Perez, also at the helm of leadership, and of course, uh, Bob Bland, who was a white woman, and then me. That was a real threat to a lot of folks. Um, they did not want to see uh, four women from so many different backgrounds coming together who would be able to put down some of our personal issues that we hold so near and dear uh, to find ways to consider uh, intersectionality that Kimberly Crenshaw explained so well, uh, that we are actually able to look across the aisle and understand that uh, there were other issues that needed to be addressed. And what I think was, was incredibly powerful about, and I talk about it in the book and, and of course on the road, I'm speaking of it all the time is this moment when Bob Bland, as the uh, white woman, a part of this foursome, if you will, um, when she asked me one day, what does uh, race have to do with women's issues? Why do we need to talk about the issues related to black women or other women of color in the midst of a conversation where we should just be talking about equal rights. And in the book, I talk about that conversation. But beyond the conversation, it was the fear that came through me. It was like a vibration that I knew at that point that, uh oh, we've got a lot of work to do to be able to build something where everyone is able to sit at this table and to feel seen um, in, in, a, in a moment when we know that there is so, the learning curve has to be quick 
Um, and, and because we are in a state of emergency, it's actually quicker than any one of us is prepared to handle. So I just wanted to make sure to say that Rabbi Sharon and I have grown, our relationship grew out of difficulty, and yet we were able to learn and to support one another. And um, that for me is, some, is a relationship that I'll cherish forever. Thank you so much, Tabika, and I, I feel so deeply the same. Um, you know, it's very difficult to create the kind of communities that will be able to withstand the pressures of what you call the regressive forces. And it's not going to be because we're all exactly the same, but we have to have shared values that can work together despite some differences. We just at our synagogue just did a whole year studying the question of allyship from a Jewish perspective. We've just self-published a book called Chaver Up, which is the Hebrew word for to be in fellowship. We asked 49 different rabbis to explore the concept of allyship because part of the issue is that we have to develop new muscles that we haven't been asked to develop as religious people. And I speak, and I know this is a, a panel of religious leaders, so I'm, uh, I, I think I'm okay talking this way. As religious people, how do we understand our obligation to be in allyship with people in places that are sometimes messy or uncomfortable? How are we able to really witness and listen to the pain of somebody else enough to understand that we are all created in the image of God and it is our job to redeem this broken world? And so for me to listen deeply to the pain of Palestinians and understand that until Palestine is free, I can't be free is a basic reality of my life. And it's also true, I've learned this in all different kinds of ways and we don't have enough time to tell my story tonight. We're here for Tamika's story, but how we learn to be able to listen like that. I'm very influenced um, by Gandhi, who is a very important teacher of mine when I was young and I continue to be a student of his and Gandhi always posed the question, how do we turn those who are against us, not just destroy them, but turn them into our allies? That question is a huge one. And he was successful sometimes and not successful others. And the other question that you asked Mitchell, how do we measure success? Well, you could say there are many things that haven't changed between last year and this, and that's true. But there have been many things that changed. Is the you know, is there's, I'm not saying it's, we have removed the problems, but we have built connections. We have laid the groundwork. We have made associations that are so deep that I think are very powerful. Uh, and the question is always this religious one, you know, that when we leave, when we leave slavery of the biblical telling, it's a long schlep through the desert. before we get to a promised land, right? That, and one of the things that I was so moved by Tamika's story and by the language of the Bible is that our job is to be strong for the journey. Not to get disappointed that we haven't fixed it all immediately and not to, under, not to think that because we haven't arrived at the solution that we haven't left the worst of it. But the most important thing is to figure out how to go through this journey of the desert together. We will only survive this together. But I, I like to things, see things on a long scale, and I'm not sure we can only say that we haven't achieved anything this year. I think there's a lot that we can look for. You know, it said when Moses and the Israelites went through the sea, they had 40 years of being in the desert ahead of them. But what did they do? They stopped and danced and sang and gave, gave glory to the Lord. Not because they had achieved everything, they had achieved, they got through the sea. They, that was a big step, but it wasn't the completion. And honestly, I think one of the things that I've learned from watching Tabika is that she expresses joy at these different moments. She doesn't let them shutter us down. And I think that's a power of a religious person. We understand that we are walking a walk with God. And even if we don't succeed every day or even in our own lifetime, there's what we're doing is laying the ground and foundation and we're walking with God and the light of the world. And, and that has to give us joy. And we have to keep doing it. That's the power, I think, of a religious person to not get completely defeated by the setbacks and by the slowness and by the, we have to keep, that strength is what gives me a lot of strength personally. And one of the things in Tamika's book that I found so deeply moving. Thank you for that. Um, Rabbi Kleinbaum. Um, Linda, I want to welcome you here. 
Um, I do want to turn. You froze for me, Michael Mitchell. Yes, he's frozen, I think, for all of us. Well, you never need anyone to ask you to talk, so just <laughs> have at it. So first of all, thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored and uh, blessed to be on this uh, panel with all of you. And of course, you know, I am wherever Tamika is. Uh, that's just, that's my philosophy in life. Um, Tamika is always at the right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, the importance of this kind of gathering today is that we're in a state of emergency. And actually when Tamika um, gave that speech and we can't kind of dubbed it the state of emergency back last year, literally a year till today, um, one of the things that I said was it was evergreen um, and it felt like it's been perpetual state of emergency for a long time. And it's probably going to be a state of emergency around the world for a long time. And so Tamika's book speaks to the time. So, I mean, it will speak next year and the year after that. To your point, Rabbi Klanval, it's not going to get better, um, that much better in even the short period of time. But one thing I know from organizing with Tamika and I hope that folks are not just buying her book, but they're buying it for someone that they love and buying it for someone maybe that wouldn't agree with someone like Tamika and just giving them an opportunity to reflect and sit in a quiet space and actually read her book and read her story. What we've experienced and what Tamika has experienced is that people have decided who we are. People have made conclusions about who we are. They have made a conclusion about her without knowing her, without even experiencing her record of work organizing on behalf of all of us for over 20 years. Um, and I, I will say that as someone who not just knows Tamika or knows of Tamika or maybe had a conversation or two with Tamika, I know Tamika. I've, I've slept in the same rooms with her. I've broken bread with her. I have lived with her. I have done many, many things. So I've co-conspired with her for um, over a decade now. And of course, knowing her work before that, um, this is a this is a story that is um, just really when I when I read her book and of course I was able to read it multiple times uh, before it was out I was living it like I was reading and living at the same time and and Tamika really brings to life in such a vivid way the experiences of organizers particularly women of color and those of us who represent marginalized communities. So I'm just blessed to be in the space uh, with all of you. Uh, and, and I know that we may not see the promised land. Me and Tamika talk about that all the time. As Dr. King said, we may not see the promised land, um, but we know that the seeds that we plant today are going to benefit generations of our families to come. And one day um, there will be a tree with fruits. Uh, and somebody will say that here is a here is a, here here is where these seeds were planted, and they, here are the people who planted them. Um, and I think that just that thought uh, for us gives us the fortitude to keep doing the work that we do. So I'm uh, I'm in this for the long haul. Pastor Mike, would you share your thoughts with us as well, please, sir? Well, I, I'll I'll um you know I was just thinking a few moments. No, no one has the corner on justice or righteousness. Um, you know, all of our faith traditions, even uh, our, our humanists or secularists uh, have a, a sense of, of what it means to build, um, or at least should have the sensibilities of what it means to build a just and a inclusive society. And, and so I think um, our work is about hammering that out in the public square. Uh, we all may arrive um, or we all may start the journey from a different starting place, but the destination uh, should always be the same. And I do think uh, there is a, a really important opportunity for us in this moment to continue to be, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass or, or uh, some of these folks used to use the North Star, right, as a, as a wonderful metaphor, where we all are, are moving in the same direction. And, and what I appreciate about um, the work that um, all of us do, um, both individually but collectively, um, is is to ensure that the audiences that we have the most resonance with, um, we we are creating the kind of containers and pathways for folks to meet at the finish line. Um, I can remember um, back in 2018, I think it was um, myself, Erica Ford, and a whole bunch of us met up. Uh, in the OSF offices in New York, 
and Tamika joined us along with some other folks, A.T. Mitchell and a whole bunch of other folks to pull together a gun violence prevention national consortium. Um, and it was there that I first heard Tamika's story of her own loss related to gun violence. Um, you know, I had seen her from afar uh, and, and had not even known her story. So to Linda's point, uh, sometimes we make lots of assumptions about folks without taking the time to learn their story. Uh, but what I appreciate about uh, that work that we did back in 2018 um, is that three years later, it, it was the skeleton that has provided us a great opportunity to respond to the state of emergency in black and brown communities impacted by intracommunal violence related to guns and, and, and violence. And so, you know, again, one of the great visionary um, gifts of, of leaders, and, and I would say Tamika is one of those, is to, um, is to be able to plant a seed that uh, will yield enough branches for lots of different folks to be able to um, benefit from. And I think that is the power of, of uh, interse intersectional leader. Uh, you know, in this country, we know that if 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 the the soil of this country has been contaminated by white supremacy since its inception, then all of these hierarchies often create enough division between all of us, where it is our division that keeps the white elite in power. But if we could ever get past some of these manufactured divisions, even though the manufacturing of these divisions make them real in our own experiences. But if we could ever uh, get past them and work, work through them, it is our unity that will um, allow us to, to perhaps, um, you know, create an environment where we are not in the state of emergency perpetually. And that is, I think, the hope of good leadership, whether you're a faith leader, whether you are a community leader, whether you are a leader in your own home, your own neighborhood, um, all of us have the capacity to lead from wherever we are. And my hope and prayer is that you will use this book, um, you will use the voices uh, of the folks you hear in this tour to help catalyze and, and inspire you to take up your own leadership um, and make it in the service of justice. I think we all share that hope and uh, those are really, profound words and very moving to me. Um, I'm going to ask one more question before we turn to some of the ones that are coming in from the audience. But um, um, my own my own background is mostly is working on the issue of Palestine and Israel. And I've been doing that for decades. And it, it can be it, it can be frustrating sometimes. Um, and I've always felt that my work on foreign policy was somehow separate from my other activism that I engaged in around social justice that was happening here. In the last year, I've really felt that change. Um, and I've really felt things that come together. And so I've been personally very engaged um, with you know, fighting against the carceral state, fighting against the police state. Um, you know, I, I presumptuous enough to use the term abolitionist to describe myself. Um, but I think all of these changes that we look at um, cannot possibly be confined to the United States. And one of the things that has become really meaningful to me is that our domestic policy can't change until our foreign policy changes and our foreign policy can't change until we change things here at home. Um, I think those things are intertwined. But the question that raises is that doesn't it make our work even more complicated, right? Um, so how do we build global movements that that still address the needs here. Um, Tamika touches on a, uh, a number of times in the book, um, the role the United States plays in the world. And I think it, as, as to whatever extent this is a democracy, we have each of us and collectively responsibility to try and address that and to steer it in, in, um, in the direction of justice. But how do we answer people, especially people who are really struggling, who say, why should I care about what's going on in Palestine when there's so many problems right here? Um, and it seems to me that one of the things that's really important there is the role of all of you as faith leaders. Um, I think that's one of the things that can bring people together, people who are, are speaking out of a place of faith, because that crosses 
all sorts of borders and boundaries, um, even if it's a variety of different faiths, or even when it's people, you know, and, and I think also we should think in, in terms of, you know, right here we have representatives of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim community, but there are many other faiths that that I think also need to be integrated into that. So I'm, I'm just going to ask each of you uh, to just chime in on how do we use that to, to, um, to meld um, our social justice work here with our work um, that 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 is is trying to change the impact of the United States around the globe. If I could just say, and, and I'd love to hear uh, these other powerful voices on this issue, but I'll just say very simply, and I tried with State of Emergency to make the reading um, and the material as simplified as possible so that every single person who picked it up felt like I can find myself in this book. Um, I wanted to make sure that the material was such that no one was intimidated because I can be very honest in saying that I have picked up some books. I've been really excited when I saw the title. I love the author. I'm ready. And I pick up the book and start reading. And I need um, a dictionary, an encyclopedia, Google, um, my text messages for Pastor Mike and other people, and of course, Linda, to transcribe what I just read. And, um, and for me, I know that in order for state of emergency to do what it is designed to do, um, it, that could not be the case. Um, it, and, and anyway, I wouldn't have been able to do it because that's just not me. So, hey, um, I wrote the book as I am. And um, I would just say that human rights are human rights, right? Um, for me, when I see issues that are happening across the world, and by the way, I'm burned out, I'm tired, I'm overloaded. Um, there's too much to think about. There's way too many issues for any one of us to be able to try to conquer. But at the same time, there are issues that happen across the world that deserve at least a post and a statement that is firm enough for people to understand um, my position on these issues as someone who is considered to be a leader. It is at least helpful to, to join the clarion call of communities outside of the United States to say, you know, this is an issue that we all need to be aware about. Um, and in any way that we can be um, a, an important part of uh, making change or shaping a discussion, we should do that. And the first thing that comes to mind for me is apartheid, and I do believe, stand by, and um, would say anywhere that I see, um, I, that I compare the conditions of the people in Palestine to an apartheid state. Um, and I um, feel like understanding America's role in how we meddle all around the world, um, almost every conflict that uh, people come to me with, they are able to pinpoint where America is somehow involved. And what's frustrating on one hand for a lot of Black folks is, is like, we can't even get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed right here by one year to George Floyd's passing. And yet we are somehow engaged in conflict within other countries. And by the way, we're not helpful in many of these situations. And so I think for me, I pay tax dollars here. I want to know where my resources are being spent and how my government is participating one way or the other in the challenges of other nations. And so I think we have the right to ask those questions. And that for me is a very simple baseline way of explaining to people why we, we do have um, a responsibility. But I do want to say that we should not put the burden of things happening even off of the block, even across the street from a person who is living in the South Bronx or on the South side of Chicago, who is struggling, just trying to feed their families. We should never make them feel like they have the burden of trying to work on or to invest much of their time and attention in things that are happening around the corner, downtown, across. They're literally trying to breathe every day. And I think I am not a religious leader. You keep saying that, Mitchell. I just want to get that straight on. On this, in you know, I Jamal Bryant tricked me into <laughs> preaching at his church by telling me that I was speaking, and then I got the well, found out about three days earlier, and I tried to get sick, 
I thought about different things that I could say and stories that I could make up about why going from speaking to being the Mother's Day speaker was very challenging. So I just wanna put that out there for the purposes of this discussion. But I do think that as leaders, we have a responsibility to be both sensitive um, to those who don't have the capacity to think outside of their current circumstances but then also to be a good leader that shows them that while it may be difficult and while we may wanna bury our heads in the sand, um, we can't as leaders with people with influence. Um, and I know I'm, I'm talking long, but I think it's important that, you know, there are some people who don't want us to be having this conversation together tonight. There are people who do not want us to sit together and be able to, to engage in civilized discussion about how we move um, you know, this, just, just the small, not the small, but the issues that we're concerned about forward. And there are people who would like for me not to ever say anything about Palestine. There are people who would want me not to be friends with Linda, um, not to work with her, but we have a responsibility, unfortunately, to step into difficult spaces and to be in places that might hurt because if people did not do that for us where would we be mitchell i'll jump in here really quickly and i appreciate your um question you know for me um i've been minimized to complicated um who i am and my identity is complicated and my people are complicated and what what my people go through is complicated don't get into that because it's so complicated and people say it's happening over there you know somewhere else you know that's not here but we are American. I'm an American. I'm your friend. And those are my family members that I have to watch and call. And if they don't answer the phone in Gaza or in the West Bank, we think they got massacred. We think they got murdered. We think they got detained. This is not a conflict that's over there. This is very much a domestic policy, um, particularly the issue of uh, aid, military aid to Israel. It is a domestic policy. Um, it, it is, as Tamika said, our taxpayer dollars going to a place like Israel to occupy Palestinians, you know, to, you know, we, we, we have a responsibility as Americans to say, as Tamika said, you know, where do my taxpayer dollar goes? I remember, you know, in 2016, when I was supporting Bernie Sanders before the kind of big movement started, you know, people said, oh, I was idealistic. What do you mean healthcare for all? Are you nuts? We don't have the resources for no healthcare. What do you mean higher access to higher education? You think that money grows on trees in America? But we do have $10 million a day that we send to the state of Israel. We have given Israel trillions of dollars of taxpayers. And right now we just approved 735 million arms sale deal. And when I'm sitting here as an American, I'm like, oh, great. Another $735 million to kill my people. Great. Thank you, everyone. That was really what, what a great government I have. And so, so what, I, what, I, what I challenge people to in these conversations is do not ever minimize someone's people suffering by calling it complicated. What is happening in Israel, Palestine is not complicated. It is apartheid. It is state sanctioned violence. It is a illegal occupation of an indigenous people. It is an actual siege on an entire group of population of people in a, the world's largest open air prison. B'Tselem is a human rights organization in Israel that has a lot of credibility that has said it's apartheid. Human Rights Watch said it's apartheid. Amnesty International said it's apartheid. Parliamentarians around the world say it's apartheid. The Palestinians say it's apartheid. I mean, if it, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, folks. I mean, I don't want to simplify it to that. But I think what's important um, is that being able to have these conversations. And for too long here in the, in the American discourse, voices like mine, voices like Tamika's and even voices like Rabbi Sharon's and amongst the kind of larger mainstream conversation on Israel get marginalized. Um, you know, we get silenced, you know, people attack us, people bully us. Um, and I think what, you know, Tamika's story and, and just who Tamika is and what her book does for people is like, you're not going to be bullied. Um, you're going to stand up for justice. You're going to be unapologetic about who you are. Every one of us have a, has a right to fight for our people. And we have a right to fight with everything that we have for our people. And we also have a right to fight for other people. And, you know, as Bernie famously says, are you ready to fight for somebody that you do not know? And I'm ready to fight for somebody that I do not know. Me and Tamika moved across the country. We, we went to live in Louisville, Kentucky, in the middle of a global pandemic to fight for a woman named Breonna Taylor. We didn't know Breonna Taylor. We knew nothing about Breonna Taylor. What we knew was is a, a woman was murdered at the hands of LMPD. And we got up and moved, our or moved away from our families, left our elderly parents in New York, left our spouses, left our children 
in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, um, and came to a city we were not from and literally just literally I picked up our lives and left for somebody that we do not know. And that is the work that Tamika does. It's the work that we do. And I think right now we are in a state of emergency, but also in a state of co courageous conversations. People got to draw the line somewhere. And that's what Tamika's book does. It draws the line. Whose side are you on? And 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, Mitchell and Rabbi Sharon, and I'll say this and pass the mic knows, guess what? We're going to be on the right side of history. I don't care about what people say about Tamika today or what they said yesterday or last year or what they'll say next week or the year after. What I do know is that we are going to be remembered in history as truth tellers, as people that fought with everything that we had, people who sacrificed what we had for what we believe in, whether that be fighting for, uh, you know, Palestinians, whether that means fighting for black people, whether that means showing up for undocumented people and children at the border separated from their families. Who, what, what, it, didn't, it doesn't matter to us who's the oppressed and who is the marginalized. You will find us there and we will be on the front lines. And so I appreciate just this modeling of a conversation about how conversations are supposed to be supposed to happen. And I said this before, we, me and Tamika's motto, we've said this to women at the Women's March before. Unity is not uniformity. I don't come to movement space to agree with everyone. I don't come there because we all are the same people or we grew up the same or we have the same uh, you know, teachings or even the same faith. Some people have no faith or same political ideology. What I do know is that we could be united on universal principles of justice, of equity, of dignity. Um, and if we can agree on those things, then I think we can kind of live in a much better world than we live in right now. Before uh, whomever is gonna speak, I have two, two points. Number one, Linda said we left our spouses I do not have a spouse. I need people to know that in case there is one that is watching that <laughs> to be in, in communication with me after this panel. So let's just make sure we put that out there. And then number two, you know, when Linda said uh, this point around what we can agree on, I was just thinking about laying in my bed watching in New York City, a Jewish man um, being beaten by people on the street. Um, of New York the, uh, just a few days ago. And I could just, I picked up my phone and I, I text a few of my other friends and of course, uh, Rabbi uh, Bara Elman, who I'm, I'm very close to and I text her. And, you know, I just said, I just want to be in a place where humanity is actually a thing like for all of us. Um, and, and I don't know how we're going to get there, Pastor Mike. Maybe you'll pray us there. Maybe there'll be some force that will move, but I am very, very concerned that we are, we've always been in a pretty bad place, but it feels like we're shifting to this environment where people, especially coming out of a pandemic, are literally melting down. Like we are, ha we're, we're really struggling. When I heard that 52 people were shot this weekend in New York City, um, and, and, and the response is more police, more violence, basically. And that is actually not going to get the job done. I'm trying to figure out, maybe I'm asking a question that someone can answer. Why is it that we keep trying to do the same things over and over again, and we know that we're not getting the results that we need? Dr. King said it like this, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. Um, and I do believe that we must be um, people committed to peace above everything else. Um, yeah. You know, the, the question raised earlier, I think ties into the question you just mentioned, why must we have a global imagination? Um, as a follower of the dark-skinned rabbi, the Palestinian Jew, uh, you know, named Jesus, um, my tradition is not limited to the United States of America. Um, the church is a, cosmic body, meaning it has no boundaries. Um, I met Palestinian Christians. They, it, when I went to, to, to Israel, Palestine in 2000, what year was that, 16, with the Dream Defenders, there were Black Palestinian Christians leading me through East Jerusalem. I stayed uh, with them on their floor and slept. They, they told me that uh, we were in Africa. They said we we're not, we're not in the Middle East, we're in Africa. This has always been called Africa. And so um, realizing that there, there are indeed 
um, Christians in every part of the world that are impacted by the militarization of the world, largely with our tax dollars, uh, requires me as a follower of Jesus, the great peacemaker, who says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, that I must prioritize peacemaking as my orientation in the world. And so I would just continue to assert that um, the answer to all of all of this that we're talking about um, is healing. It is it is ensuring that we acknowledge the trauma, the pain of the suffering um, that we bind together to defeat the 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 wickedness of the uh, elite few who are often hiding from our plain view, uh, but with organizing and with solidarity um, and with compassion, love and curiosity, strength um, that is fueled by of the spirit, uh, we can bring down these high places um, and we don't have to wait until we die to see a glimpse of heaven on earth in our lifetime. Uh, I saw a glimpse of heaven organizing in Ferguson. I saw a glimpse of heaven organizing here in Oakland. I saw a glimpse of heaven uh, watching my brother stand with uh, Tamika and Linda in, in, in Louisville for the Brianna stuff. So uh, these victories in the short term uh, give us reminder that uh, this is possible in our lifetime. We just have to read that in front of us. You muted. Rabbi, yeah, I got it. <laughs> Rabbi Sharon? The, the most famous sentence right from this whole time, you're muted. That becomes our slogan. So I'm so deeply moved by being here because one of the greatest challenges we have is to be able to engage with the people we love who with whom we disagree, right? And with the people who are, it's easy to disagree with some, uh, uh, some distant mass of an oppressor. So for sure, I am the first to acknowledge that within my own people, the Jewish people, we have made some very serious mistakes. We, the Jew, I hope it's not me personally. Um, and I hold myself to account for that. I also know that change happens when people change. I mean, and I, my part of my job is to work on my people. One of the differences that I see, but I don't disagree at all about the descriptions of what the state of Israel has done in, in so many ways. The big difference between South Africa is that in South Africa, it was illegal to organize within the state against the state of apartheid. And what's happened in Israel, there is a progressive left that exists there, is, there are a lot of Israeli Jews who care deeply, like this American Jew, about justice and peace for all in that region to make sure there's a future. We have to ask what happens the day after the revolution, right? What happens after the day? How are people going to live together? And uh, tomorrow, for instance, I'm flying to Israel, Palestine to be able to meet with people who are the peacemakers, who are struggling to create a joint future. The day after the election, in two, uh, the day uh, of the inauguration in 2017, I woke up and I said to myself, the day after the election in 2016, I woke up on that Friday, so Friday after the election, I said to myself, as much as a lesbian, as a Jew, I fear for the America that Trump will bring. How does a Muslim American feel? He started the entire campaign on an anti-Muslim speech. That was his introduction to America. I got a few people from our synagogue to go to our, a local mosque with whom I have a relationship with the Imam for many years. And we stood in front as, as worshipers who were coming in for the Juma prayer, just with signs that say, Jewish New Yorkers stand with our Muslim neighbors. And we, we got roses from the flower district, gave it to people. And I could see as people were walking up for prayer that there was anxiety because they saw a group of Jews standing there. And when they approached closer and they read the signs, you know, huge smiles, hugs, kisses, we gave them the roses. And every single Friday from the moment of the inauguration until the COVID shutdown, our synagogue was in front of that uh, mosque welcoming worship. It became part of our preparations for Shabbat. It became such a part of that community's experience of Juma that one two and a half year old went with his parents to another mosque on a Friday and said, you know, where are the Jews? Isn't this part of going to prayer to have Jews outside? And yet we don't all agree on every single thing. And I believe in a progressive Israel that will challenge the right wing fundamentalists, which are choking us, just like every religion has within it 
right-wing regressive forces. We pray and we see them in Muslim countries around the world. We see them in Christian countries around the world and we see them in America. So my dream is that we are able to reach across these kinds of differences to create a future for all of us, that Israeli Jews, Palestinians will be able to create a shared future. I believe in that, you know, call me crazy, but I believe in that. And I know the struggle is deep, but I think if we're gonna change the world, we have to do it from within our own communities and to be able to reach hands across really big differences. So I'm very moved and deeply proud to be here with all of you. And Linda and Tamika, we had that photograph taken of the four of us at that lunch. Yes, it will be. You know? And I'm so proud of that photograph. Yeah, it'll be with us forever. And I just want to deposit that the reason why I mentioned in the context of building a global movement, um, the apartheid state of Africa, right, is because Americans and people here and young people on college campuses helped um, to support challenging it. And I think yep. that that's what we have to look at our ways that we can be a part I of. I totally agree. It's just, it's just I, 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 if there's a difference, I don't think all Israeli Jews disagree with it. I think there are many who I agree. agree. And I don't, and there are many states that we want to struggle to transform. I just, and I pray that when there is a Palestinian state in 60 years, uh, you will be a flourishing state with freedom and liberty for all. And I pray that in Israel will, will be transformed. I deeply, deeply pray for that and I work for it. Just as I work in this country to fight for racial justice every day of my life, I consider that as a, 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 as a person who's Jewish and therefore I come from a white Jewish background, although we have many Jews of color, it's my job because two reasons, God demands it of me and my history teaches me that we have to be on the side of wherever there is pain and oppression. So um, we're, we're just about out of time and I'm, I'm so I have to apologize to the audience that um, those of you who did submit <laughs> questions, we're, we're probably not gonna get to them, but, but there, I, I wanna give um, everybody, uh, before I turn it back over to Tamika, I wanna give every the, the panelists who are still here um, a chance to do some, some closing comments and one, uh, maybe one thing you might wanna take on is that someone did ask, what is the truth you want our generation to know, ground ourselves in, and use to manifest freedom? So I think that's that's pretty broad, and, and I think that, but I think it's also a, a, to the point, a very you know, to very much to the heart of Tamika's book. So I think it might be a good place for for if you want, or you can go somewhere else, but uh, it, it, you can go in a different direction. But uh, if you want to use that for to sort of ground your uh, closing remarks. So I didn't know I was giving closing remarks. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. And because I don't follow directions well, I am going to choose um, a different direction uh, for, for this moment. You know, my book is dedicated to my son. Um, and I think it was Pastor Bryant who said before he left us um, the, the, the quote around looking in the mirror, that that's a very difficult space for us, right? It's easier for us to, as you said, um, Rabbi Sharon, we can we can be mad at out there. You know, we always do this and yeah. let the, the people over there. Like that's what we often like to focus on. But I dedicated my book to my son because um, I recognize how much of the work with him I have not done while fighting for other people's children. Mm -hmm. I've shown up all over the country to support other people. I've actually traveled to uh, Israel, Palestine. I've, I've been there to support so many and yet and still the state of emergency that my own child sort of found himself in not having his father. Uh, his father's been deceased now for 20 years. Um, you know, uh, growing up in a community that is not kind um, with people who look at a young black boy as being a dangerous black man um, all of those things and having a mother who was always on the front line for other people must have and continues to probably be very challenging for him. And it is a relationship Linda knows because she sees us all the time going up and down with our struggles. Um, and so I dedicated the book to him 
And I think that there is another part of the book where I talk so much about this idea that before we join movements, we have to first of all work on the movement within us. We have to work on the biases that we are carrying with us. If you um, can't deal with the fact that your mother or father or some family member or people you love um, are the very ones perpetuating uh, racism and sexism and all the other is isms um, towards other people and towards marginalized communities, then how do you show up on the front lines of a movement and say, I'm here, not only am I here, I'm here to lead, because those are often the folks who think that they actually know how to, to lead the movement. They've got all the information. They've read the books. Uh, they're so well versed. They can say the words. They know the, the, the language but they haven't done anything to clean up what is going on inside. They're not uncomfortable. They're not getting uninvited from Thanksgiving dinner. Um, they're not the person that people would, would know in their own circles. I can't be this or do this or harm other people around uh, my, my sister, my niece, my daughter, because she is someone who really truly is an accomplice to those people who are hurting. And so I just suggest that Folks who pick up state of emergency, pick it up understanding that each one of us has work to do. I have work to do with my own family. I also have work to do to grow, to be a stronger leader. And I think that today, um, on the day, I, I agree with you, Rabbi Sharon, 100% that um, this, you know, having uh, or, 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 or saying that nothing has changed is disingenuous. Because the one thing that I think has changed tremendously is that from uh, the moment that we saw Ahmaud Arbery being uh, hunted and shot to death last year to the Breonna Taylor situation, and then of course watching George Floyd be murdered, hearts and minds have changed. People have shifted. And people have decided that they are going to own this movement and that they are, they're now here. They may not be perfect. None of us are perfect. The movement certainly isn't perfect. But the idea that we now have new people who are, who are allies maybe at this moment, but are working on becoming true accomplices, to me, that is historic. And it is um, something that I'd like to claim as a win, as victory for us, as we all work to shape the real change that we know we need to see in this nation. So that's what State of Emergency is all about. I hope you go out and get it. And, um, and, and again, I wrote this book so that a mother and her teenage son could read it together. And I hope that it will truly be transformative for you the way that writing it was transformative for me. If there's any, um, do, do folks want to make any other last comments before we close? Go yeah. get the book. I'll, I'll be the one. Go I'm ahead. always yeah. happy. We're, we're, we're all happy to talk. I thought you would be. I was a little surprised it took so long. Yeah, I will just say um, for folks who are watching, um, we can talk all day, but we got to tell you that there are things that you can do. And um, if you really support the movement and want to support the work and leadership of Tamika Mallory, definitely visit us at untilfreedom.com. Um, you know, this is a movement that is uh, fueled by people, um, people who believe in justice for black people, people who believe in a country that need, that should be standing up or fulfilling its original ideals. And that's what we do every day. And so it's great to get a book. And, and Tamika sold lots of books and I'm so proud of her. Um, and she's going to continue to sell books because that's what we do. But I think more so making sure that you're supporting her leadership on the front lines. It's a dangerous place out there um, on these streets. And, you know, three truths that you um, said, Mitchell, that I, you know, that I would want people to know. And they're all quotes by very famous people as we continue on the work of racial justice and police equity, uh, police accountability is one by Ida B. Wells that says those who commit the murders write the reports um, so that people continue to hear these stories of police murders around the country. Just know that those who commit the murders write the reports. The other truth is one by Malcolm X, who says that the media is the most powerful entity in the world. And it can have you hating the oppressed and loving the oppressor. And that I've experienced on many levels in many different ways in many of the movements that I'm a part of. And one from Nelson Mandela, who at some point the United States government had designated a terrorist 
And the ANC, a terrorist organization, said that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people. And that's what Nelson Mandela said. And so as we revere people and bring people up and we quote them on their birthdays and the days of their assassination, let's remember them in their entirety. And I hope that one day people will remember us in our entirety. I just want to end by offering you a blessing, Tamika. I pray that God continues to surround you with God's light and love and strength and remind you of the deepest truth of all, that you are created in the image of God. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you so much. Pastor Mike, say go. Pastor, get Pastor Mike, you have some yeah. closing comments? Go, go, go get the book. Remember that the, the first revolution is an internal revolution. If, if you have not yet gone through your series of revolutionary transformations, may this book be the seed that is planted in your heart um, to push you to the edge of your mind so you can change your mind. Mm. Uh, change your mind to be a freedom fighter, to be a lover of humanity, a steward of all creation, and above all else, a peacemaker. Um, God bless uh, my friend Tamika and congratulations. And uh, let's all go out here and sound the alarm. We're in a state of emergency, y'all. It's up to us. So I just want to close by by thanking everybody here, um, both people who, who I've met before and people who I'm meeting for the first time. I really want to thank Tamika for, for allowing me to moderate this panel. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, but there's just so much to say here. And this book is a profoundly uh, moving book and it will get you going. And if you look at some of the activities that Rabbi Sharon and Pastor Mike and Linda and Tamika are, are undertaking, just Google them. It, you will find things to do. You will find direction to help bring the just world that we all want. So thanks everybody for coming. And thank you again so much, Tamika, for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Barbara's Bookstore and of course to my team. Thank you all so much for coordinating. Bye. Bye. Love y'all.